Well, this is a good Building a Better Me song. I, I really love this little voiceover at the beginning of this song about the lady and the squirrels. Yeah, so this is the White Stripes. It's called Little Acorns. And so it, it, it's this, I don't know if it's 50s, I may not be right, but like for me it makes me think of these old school Bible stories. They used to tell. Oh, that's that's what I was thinking it's too. Very much like the it's like children's gospel children, hour or yes, something. It's like children's gospel hour, and so it tells this story about this lady, um, and so she says, right, like you know, all these bad things happen, but as she she decided that she would tackle her problems bit by bit, and then she was able to overcome all of the disasters that had befallen her. So he so then he, in the song he's like, be like the squirrel girl, be like the squirrel, because she talk, he talks about how a squirrel saves up nuts one by one for the winter. So you just do it bit by bit. And actually, I've thought about this quite a bit, because this, and there was this, so I went to a Christian school when I was a kid, and there was this one song we sang, we had to, we had this thing, I was sixth grade, it was called sing Spiration, and we would sing these <laughs> I love sixth graders. Oh, you're, you're just <laughs> old enough to be like, uh, oh my gosh. But not old enough to like, like rebel. Right. Well, and back then, I, I mean, kids just, especially at a Christian school, just weren't as savvy as kids are now. Oh. Like, I try to do that to our fifth graders. I can't even imagine that. So, one of the songs I still remember it to this day little by little. Inch by inch by the yard, it's hard by the inch. What a cinch, never stare up the stairs, just step up the steps, little by little, inch by inch. Wow, that's awesome. It's actually a really oh good message. Wow. So, here's something interesting. If someone were to say to you the phrase, what is the most important step a man could take? What would you think the answer would be? Uh, the first the one. The first one, right? Yeah. yeah, so you all think, of course, the first one. So, in my Sanderson book, <laughs> this is the, one of the main characters has to decide. So, like, you're on Oathbringer, right? I'm That's on the third one. The third one, okay. Now, spoilers if you're going to read this series. But, so, one of the main characters, you know, this is said to him in a vision, what's the most important step that a man can take? So, of course, he thinks it's the first step. I, everyone, right? As a reader, I think it's the first step too. So then it's interesting, like, it's all the shit is hitting the fan. Like, the world's falling apart. It's gonna end. Everyone's gonna die. I'm like, there's no way. There's no way Sanderson can write his his way out of this. Like, it's the, okay, great. We're just gonna kill everybody off book three of a ten part series. And so it's this, like, critical moment for this main character. And, um, He's about to give in to the enemy and he goes no the most important step a man can take is the second and I thought that was really deep because right like you know to be like oh, I'm gonna do this and then you you kind of uh, have that like yes the first step like yeah but then right. it's like crap am I really gonna keep doing this right. so the, the most important step that a man can take is the second is after step. after you've seen what is coming at you. Like, yep. the first step, you're kind of naive, but then the second step, after the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune have yeah. hit you in the face, yeah. are you going to take the second step? Yeah. Mm, that's, that ain't I bad. I was like, Sanderson, you've done it again, me boy. <laughs> my name is Ford Seuss. I'm 36 years old, and I'm starting over. My previous adventure was outward, living my dream of discovering India and sharing it with the world. But this new adventure is inward, facing my lifelong struggle with depression and finding renewed purpose. Join me on this new journey of self-discovery and personal reinvention, building a better me. The process of building a better me in 2018 is proving to be one marked by numerous fits and starts. This week, both me and Melissa had I, I think you could say I'm an emotional breakthrough. We we're having our live stream uh, with viewers and just kind of out of nowhere, we both broke down for different reasons. So today, mainly vlog commentary, us kind of digesting and sharing some of these stories uh, that have been encouragement to us, and hopefully they can be an encouragement to you as well. Um, yeah, actually, like when we were watching that war video last week, like I was like this close to like bursting into tears. I was like, oh my oh, gosh, really? I miss it so much. Yeah. 
Oh, jeez. I didn't know that. Wow. That's <coughs> real. My wife can't act. Choking so on this my is, coffee. My wife can't act, so this is 100% real. But, yeah. So, that's why I don't watch a lot of indie stuff. So. Wow, I didn't know. So, I mean, this is, we're almost... Too soon. Too soon. We're a year and a half out, and it's still too soon. And Melissa also got the chance to... Uh, watch an episode of Chef's Table of all things, which is such a fantastic show. We were really touting it a lot on our live stream on Sunday. Uh, but it's this one man's story, Ivan Orkin, uh, really inspired her and kind of gave her hope in the wake of losing India because that was just such a big part of our lives. It was interesting this week reading this viewer story and I also watched a Chef's Table episode about Ivan Orkin. It was the sum of all of his experiences living overseas marrying a foreigner, coming back to the States, going to chef school, then going back to Japan, then actually cooking the best ramen by Japanese standards as a white guy in Tokyo, um, to losing his first wife. It was this tragedy, but all of those bad experiences, all the setbacks, all the not fitting in actually was leading up to him finding his place in the world after he was 40. We're fast approaching 40, so maybe there's still hope for us play goes on and you may contribute a verse what will your verse be yeah and we know we lost uh robin williams and i know right he's, he's one of our greats you know that's what building better me is about is trying to sort through this stuff that, that you the, will leave a verse in the world, but you will still be there. That you will still be to there share your to verse share it. In you know? the end, the well-roundedness is what we're really trying to shoot for here. He's trying to find a way to be a poet and a farmer. <laughs> to the interplay of these different disciplines, the interplay of these different cultures, these interplay of these different constructive pursuits to be able to make something, uh, to make ourselves better people, and to not give up. One of the most impactful truths to me is that often our best artists are tortured, often by depression, but. Other times it's something more obvious like Beethoven and his deafness. Uh, the greatness seems to come from the weakest moments of humanity. and Right, those dark colors. Those dark colors. Those dark colors are very formative. Yeah. You know, very formative. I mean, the, the flood's going to come. And what kind of person are you going to be when it hits you? Robert Williams' art wasn't enough to save him. And, um, and he, had the best, he had the best treatment, the best drugs, the best counselor's money could buy. Um, and they still, you know, couldn't save him. And this is not to fault Robin Williams. I don't want to do that for a second because, mm -hmm. you know, he's a legend. He's a legend for a reason. But we keep losing people like him. You know, I think of Chris Farley. I mean, he's just a comedian. But uh, he meant so much to so many people. You think about how many, how many of these people that mean so much to us. Whether it's, you know, whether you, you loved Kurt Cobain or Chris Cornell. We just lost Dolores Reardon from um, The Cranberries. We keep losing these people, you know, trying to keep another Robin Williams or another Philip Seymour Hoffman from doing this. Just can't keep losing these people. Um, you know, that's what this Building a Better Me is about. In our reverse redaction podcast, my buddy Judah had a great little bit of advice uh, from a counselor friend of his uh, regarding depression. So hopefully this might be encouraging to someone out there who is, uh, if you're suffering from debilitating depression, try this out. I think... There's really something to this. I think we, we, we've talked about this before, but there's a ten, temptation and a tendency to medicate depression with things that aren't actually helpful. Um, there's a difference between medication that's good and medication that's actually uh, you know, an addiction or an obsession that kind of distracts you from the problem. I thought this bit of advice was pretty helpful. I always see depression as a sign that something isn't working. It's also very rare, in my opinion, that people actually sit with and engage in depression. Our society has mm. too many rescues, yes. and drugs, and yes. alcohol, TV, yes. and these escapes. I reframe depression as not being able to, as not being able to leave the bed in the morning, and how most people can let themselves just just stay in bed, stay with their feelings, and and let depression lead to change and growth. Mm -hmm. Anytime I work with somebody who's depressed, identifies as depressed, I prescribe the symptom and tell them to stay in bed all weekend. Don't watch TV. Don't escape. Don't, you know, medicate. 
and they come back on Monday ready to work. Yeah, see, I think that is fantastic. I think, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're a believer or not. If you can go back and look at the book of Job, like that is a master class in dealing with depression. You've got three friends who are trying to blame him, trying to admit his culpability. You know, oh, you did something that wrong here. Sometimes that's true for someone in depression. Sometimes they've made a lot of bad decisions and that needs to be worked through. Like if it if it's true, you must work through it. Sometimes things suck yeah. and the system isn't fair. So you don't pretend that it's that it's right. That everything's okay. Yeah. yeah, something's broken and this person's mourning about it and you want to just throw this little bandaid over. No, no, society's perfectly fine. I mean, think it was worse 100 years ago. Yeah, you're not listening to me. Something's messed up. Yeah. And like, I love, again, I, I, you know, I talk about Serenity Firefly all the time, but uh, for me, there, there's that moment where uh, in Serenity River, she throws up after she's seen this, this communique that shows you know, this record that shows what happened like this has been assaulting her mind. She's had these millions of dead people in her mind, but she couldn't articulate. And so when she sees what it actually looks like, she's like, I'm okay. Like she's able to actually feel herself for a little bit. She had all this weight that she was carrying around. We've had two viewers confide some of the hardship that they've gone through to kind of just let us know that we're not alone. And, and it, you know, the, the suffering these people have gone through has been humbling. It kind of puts things in perspective. Just to reemphasize how universal this problem is, uh, just this morning I had a message from a longtime viewer and fan of the channel who has an India connection, been following us ever, time, ever since we were in India, been very supportive and encouraging. Uh, and just this morning she had written me this, for just wanted to share something pertinent with you. My late husband had bipolar disorder. He suicided via gunshot. I came home from work and found him. He died two weeks later. I had a therapist for a year following his death. It was noted that my decades working in mental health and addictions fields helped me to understand what and why it happened. I have some PTSD. I think if my hubby knew that, he would not have hit, had me be the one to find him. He just didn't want me to worry. This is something that affects people of all age groups, uh, Americans, Indians, Japanese. Uh, this is a common problem in the human condition. And I think it's getting worse with the excess of technology. Uh, just. You know, one of my favorite bands is Radiohead, and all of their music kind of centers around this theme of feeling disconnected in this overconnected world. Like the technology that's supposed to help us have better lives has unintended consequences sometimes of, of alienation and loneliness and isolation. And uh, what we're hoping to do is utilize some of this technology to be able to connect people who are struggling with those kind of things. Let's push back, you know, use the tools that we have in a more constructive way, in a less sensational way. One of the purposes of building a better me is to be a kind of group therapy session online for us to share stuff that's helping us with people all around the world uh, and to learn from them, to be honest. Uh, we've actually taken a lot away from a viewer all the way over in India who's been sharing his story with us over the last couple of years. And there's so much of what he says can apply to anyone. It doesn't matter your creed, color, background, ethnicity. There's something you can take away from this young man's story. He was born in a middle class uh, Indian family in which they were kind of on the line. They, they were, had enough money from his dad's job to be able to have a house, but they couldn't afford cars, so they still use bicycles. They actually have to go a significant walking period in order to get uh, water. They have a refrigerator, but they don't have the running water in the house to actually, they can actually drink. So when he faced a significant medical problem, his family didn't necessarily have the resources uh, to deal with it, but they did. They put the money in and it was expensive and it was hard, but they tried to navigate it. Uh, but this medical problem he had made it very difficult for him to succeed in school and he had to change his major after three years of fighting. And he felt ashamed, he felt like he'd left his parents down, uh, but he just couldn't mentally deal with it because of the difficulties of this medical problem. And then on the back end of that, after having worked through three years of this difficulty with the medicines he was having to take uh, and the way that was changing his biochemistry, the depression he was facing because he didn't feel like he was measuring up, a friend of his committed suicide. On the back end of that, some of these things may seem small in the, con in the scheme of things, but everything adds up 
he had developed a relationship with a street dog, a friendship with a street dog that he treated kind of like a pet, taking care of this this pet, and it was you know part of his life. It was like his friend. And after his uh, real friend committed suicide, the street dog, you know, one of his was one of his companions, and the street dog died not long after that. Before all this, he was sexually molested as a child, which is a rampant problem in India and across the world. In places like India, it's difficult to talk about this. People do not want to talk about this. It's been like that in America um, forever. I mean, you think about Spotlight, that's one example of it. But the shame associated with even sharing what happened is so difficult for people. So he had that happen before the medical problems, before his friend committing suicide. But after having dealt with that, achieved some normalcy, he was accosted by four men that he could not identify and raped. So tragedy upon tragedy upon tragedy, uh, setback upon setback upon setback, and then facing grief and pure evil. How do you even begin to bounce back from this? This week, after reading his story, uh, I thought it was interesting. He really points out, you know, the suffering as a child made him strong enough to handle the health issue suffering that he went through which made him able to be strong enough to um, to survive the evil that was done to him as an adult and he's been able to be strong enough to still believe that he's lucky to be alive you know so he says this forgetting the lessons that tragedy and suffering teaches is like erasing the process in a long and difficult game if we don't learn from it and don't learn the significance of ourselves we will be stuck in this paradoxical life where we keep suffering and it keeps making us numb. And before we know it, we get to the point where we can't even reset the game anymore. You know, we went to India looking for creative, cross-cultural and constructive connection. And the great thing about the internet now is we can still keep having creative, cross-cultural and constructive connections across the world. And uh, we can encourage each other. We can have this kind of group therapy session through the internet. And so. We're really thankful for that. We're really thankful for all of you who continue to watch. And we hope that by having sharing these stories one with another, that we can help each other find our place, that we can keep going, we can hold on long enough to realize, oh, wait, I think I might fit in good in that thing. So wherever you are in this world, from America to India to Japan or beyond, if you're having a hard time keeping creative, cross-cultural, constructive, staying strong, staying glorious, keep going. And if you're having a hard time doing that, just hold on because you just don't know. It may be a lot more pain in the future. Uh, for our viewer, it was a lot more pain before he found the road to the place that he wants to be in this world. Uh, but he's on that road and he knows it and he's not going to stop. Uh, for Ivan Orkin, it was many years before he was able to find his place in the world. He had to hold on through a lot of pain. Uh, but I think the holding on really is worth it. As we strive to keep going, keep holding on, let's keep sharing these constructive stories from other people or people we know or maybe even our own story uh, because so much of the media is focused on this if it bleeds, it leads sort of way of doing things, the bad news. We need more good news, not pat good news, but good news in the face of actual evil, good news in the face of actual setbacks, good news in the face of grief. We need some more of that. and so. Let's just keep doing that. Thank you.